What I kind of really realized is, especially when I had my first breakout in trading, was it's not necessarily that these traders that are getting these exponential outcomes um, are the, are the you know these crazy smart guys. It's just more so that they position themselves in activities in which they can see. 10x exponential returns and I, I think sometimes you know we're not positioning ourselves enough in these and we want that result but we're not positioning ourselves in a way where we can we can get those exponential results and you know those types of opportunities are a lot more available to people than maybe they may quite frankly understand <laughs> my name is gavin you are listening to sometimeish this is a podcast where sometimes we talk about life sometimes we talk about business sometimes we may talk about current events or just speak what's on our mind but all the time you will be educated informed and you will want to tune in for another episode i'm here with the real estate entrepreneur trader caleb jackson and i'm here with real estate entrepreneur dallas basha thank you guys so much for joining me on the show thank you my good sir yeah Appreciate you. Yeah, Thank absolutely, you. absolutely. This yeah. is a great time to talk to you guys. You guys shared a wealth of knowledge, and I would love to have you guys back on the show for for another episode. Thank a, you. A million views in six months. Uh, let's, let's get it, guys. Let's yeah, get I'll it. Give you guys a cut. <laughs> <laughs> and bro, you, you have like a radio DJ voice. Yeah, I, I love know, it. It's so smooth. Yeah. Let me tell you, Gavin uh, is a dangerous dude, but no, no, no. This man is a dangerous. We'll, we'll yes. keep that. We'll keep that offline, though. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah, if you guys could go ahead, like, subscribe, uh, give us five stars, give us reviews, and add this to whatever playlist that you have, whatever system you're you're listening on, and we look forward to seeing you for another episode. Take care. So you guys closed some deals recently. You guys want to kind of introduce yourselves, talk about sure. those. What's what's new? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Caleb Jackson. Um, I'm the founder of Lion Development. This is my partner Dallas here, um, and we just closed on two deals for our student housing program over in Baltimore. And again, I'm Dallas. Um, I'm a real estate operator and uh, Caleb and I, as he mentioned, recently expanded into the uh, Charles Village Baltimore market where we're looking to uh, redefine the student housing market and provide quality housing uh, while focusing on the end user uh, and uh, looking to differentiate ourselves within that market and eventually expand to other markets. And we really appreciate you, Gavin, for hosting us here and sure. we're really excited to start the conversation off so thank you very much for sure thank you yeah. guys so much for coming thank you for thank sure you. for sure so you guys are relatively young how did you how did you start how did you start in real estate yeah so um my story really started um when i went to school at lehigh university up in pennsylvania mm -hmm. i uh, my family had some background in real estate but they never really took it full time uh, and I always was interested in getting involved in real estate. I just didn't know when the right time would take place. And as a student, uh, as a freshman at Lehigh, I, I identified a market problem, which was there are maybe two or three main off-campus providers for off-campus housing that offered, uh, that basically owned the market. They, they had 90% of the supply. And what that allowed them to do was um, offer subpar product, not the greatest management because their mindset typically is they're just students. So we'll just do the bare minimum and they would still charge an arm and a leg. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why does it have to be that way? Why, why is the, and I hear it time and time again, not only from the, from the management companies, but just everyday people, even family or friends are like, they're just students, just throw some paint on it and call it a day. And my mindset is why can't we provide a quality um, product, provide competitive pricing and everyone's happy. Uh, you don't have to make it the the uh, Ritz Carlton and, and, and cost and everything like that, but you could be a little bit thoughtful on the design, on uh, having more of a personalized management touch. So as a freshman, I realized that opportunity um, and uh, I ended up going into finance. Uh, I was uh, a financial planner as a college student for a couple of years. I thought that was going to be my route uh, and thought I was going to go into finance, uh, possibly work in New York. And I did that for two years. I ended up having some success in that. And through that success, uh, made some money and ended up doing my first deal. I partnered with, I did a round of family and friends and bought my first off, off campus property at Lehigh. And through that first iteration and uh, over time did the same model. Um, well, actually, when I first bought that first property, I thought to myself, wait a second, I don't want to wait another two years to earn enough money to then go buy another deal. 
there has to be an easier way to do this. And that's when I started doing a little bit more research on YouTube and reading some books and decided uh, that there's actually a model called syndication where you're able to work with outside investors. And I, and I basically did that with the family and friend uh, round, but I didn't really put two and two together to think of it more of on a, on a grandiose scale and re realized that if I want to continue to scale um, in buying real estate, it's better to uh, partner with people. Uh, you go further with a team versus going by yourself. Uh, so I ended up uh, over time built credibility within my inner circle and people around me and started posting on social media a little bit more frequently as far as what I'm doing, the real estate transactions I'm interested in, in executing on and over time built a little bit more credibility and uh, continued to expand in that, in that realm. And actually funny enough, uh, one of my favorite deals which was purchased during the pandemic, I ended up partnering with my former Lehigh professor and together and, and one of his friends, we ended up uh, buying a property together and, and had some success there. And uh, he ended up becoming a really good friend of mine. Uh, but those were the first iterations of getting involved in real estate and, and now having the pleasure to work with Caleb and expanding our um, real estate portfolio from Pennsylvania to the Baltimore market and uh, operating it with uh, Caleb is something I'm very excited about. Um, and now I know Caleb has some great stories to talk about oh, yeah. uh, on his real estate transactions. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I moved out of my house, out of my mother's house when I was 15 to go live in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. And the thing is, is that my grandfather, who was really like my dad, um, you know, emotionally and, and everything like that, he was a Washington, D.C. real estate investor. He passed away when I was 15 years old. And that, like, to me, emotionally just kind of like was a very significant experience in my life and i made the internal commitment to be a real estate entrepreneur really from that moment but the thing is is that you know i'm you know young i'm broke you know real estate how 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 do you get into such an industry um so it was really an experience of me really just trying to find my way so when I was at Howard University, I ended up linking with my friend Imani Blackman, who was really uh, introducing me to financial literacy concepts for the first time. And he ended up introducing me to a friend who um, was buying properties in his you know, early teenage years. So that was kind of like a, okay, you can somehow, some way own real estate despite not being a multimillionaire and mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, saving up all this money beforehand. And so I had a nonprofit over in Kingston, Jamaica that really had a lot of traction. And my friend Ben Moschel um, saw like the work that we were doing, um, you know, on social media. So he reached out to me, hey, let's catch up and all that kind of stuff. I updated him on what I'm doing. Um, he updated me on what he was doing in Baltimore. And I said, you know, do you mind if I just come and take the bus from Howard? And let me just come and see what you guys are doing. And I'm coming up to Baltimore and my mind is blown the way these guys are moving, flipping all these different types of deals, owning them. I'm touring all these properties and you know, that's when I really got exposed to the concept of wholesaling, but then I was really able to see the entrepreneurial side of real estate. And that was when I was, you know, internally able to really have that understanding that it's possible to get into deals. I, I, you know, I was really attracted to wholesaling, not necessarily because I want to be a wholesaler long term, but there was one skill set that you get from wholesaling, which is the ability to find great opportunities and you know, bring opportunities and value to the marketplace and build relationships and go from there. So I ended up dropping out of, uh, you know, Howard at the time to partner with an agent um, who was living in Baltimore to do wholesaling. And um, within the first week, he quit. <laughs> <laughs> so I just dropped out of school. <laughs> I moved out of my grandma's house. Um, and I don't know what I am going to do to like survive or whatever the case may be. So I'm, I just remember just sitting on my couch and I called Ben and I was just like, listen, um, I have nothing. Um, I'm trying to get into this real estate space. Let me just come work with you for a little bit, you know, learn the game. And, um, you know, if it doesn't work out, at least I learned, you know, some lessons or whatever the case may be. Um, ended up meeting with Ben and within the first week got my first deal. 
um, at that point in time, I kind of really learned uh, it's not really, you know, working hard is one thing, but it doesn't matter how hard you work on the wrong activities, you will get nowhere. Um, but if you work on the right activities, you can get exponential results. So my first deal was flipping a, a $50,000 uh, you know, a fifty thousand dollar property in Eastwood, Baltimore City. I uh, made about five thousand dollars on that deal. And to be very honest with you, that was the most significant check of my entire life because I had been dreaming for at least maybe three or four years about getting into real estate. How am I going to do it? Um, and then to now get compensated from a real estate transaction. Yes, it was a flip, but that was the most important like confirmation deal of my entire life. And later on that same year, ended up doing you know almost two hundred thousand dollars um in just net you know profit from these wholesale flips and the thing is is that if you look at jeff bezos and a lot of the great these great ceos they didn't save their ways to a billion dollars right there's a model there was just some way that they were able to do that and i was really um you know looking to do that so i started to really get the right mentors around me um, my first mentor that was really, really significant was, is a, a gentleman named Bob Penaloza. And he took me into his board meetings where I'm now seeing these, these, um, entrepreneurs who are, you know, having $300,000, you know, cash burn rates per day. They're doing, you know, billion dollar deals and acquisitions and being able to sit at the table and observe these CEOs and how they operate really gave me a in as to how I need to be thinking about building my business and building my portfolios. So I've always just tried to surround myself with great mentors who are a million steps ahead of me to help me chart my path. And then in working with the Moschel brothers, I um, was really able to build my foundation as an entrepreneur. So um, now obviously I'm working with um, Dallas where we're building our student housing portfolio and we're just off to the races from there. Hey, Caleb. Uh Really quickly, how did you find your first your first mentor, and what advice would you give to others on uh, putting their, themselves around a, a winning circle? Yeah, that's actually a great question, and I actually realized that I just misspoke because my first mentor um, was actually Tim Dusen. God bless his soul. He recently passed away to, due to COVID, and I come from a very like academic household, so my parents way and I love my parents and they love me and I have an amazing relationship with my mother. Um, but it's, it's a very academic household, but I always knew that there was another way. I always knew that there was an, you know, another way to achieve success. So what I would do is I would interview CEOs, no, um, expectations of anything. My, my email was just simply, Hey, my name is Caleb. I'm, you know, 18 years old, 17 years old. I'm learning how I want to be successful like you. I don't know what to do. Can I please just take 30 minutes out of your job, I mean, out of your day uh, to just interview you and ask you some questions? So my first CEO that really came in as a mentor was Tim Dusen. That interview, he runs a construction company over in, in Delaware where they're building these luxury like $10 million, $20 million houses in Greenville, Centerville, Delaware. And um, he only has a college, I mean, a high school diploma. He didn't even go to college at all. So he was the most successful guy that I ever met who has like a high school diploma. And now you can start to contrast when you're around these people. Okay, I'm getting advice from this set of people with these set of values and these set of results. They may not be having what I want in life, but then now I'm starting to, um, you know, meet these, these entrepreneurs and these CEOs who have what I want in a similar story and you can contrast where you want to go. Um, so in terms of answering the question as to how do you find these people, I think the biggest thing is to just reach out and, and, and ask a question and, 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 um, and send emails. It's actually surprising. I sent an email to like Rob Refkin, the CEO of, of Compass. He literally emailed me back within, um, in under an hour, actually. Um, so I think a lot of people may think that these entrepreneurs or these CEOs are just untouchable. And so they don't even try to reach out in the first place. And you'll be surprised what um, results you can get if you mm -hmm. go down that path. Was there ever like a value add in the email? Was there like, I can do for you? Or was it just a, hey, I'm a young kid, I'm looking to learn? Well, the thing is, is that I knew that I can be unconventional in my approach in my younger uh, high teens, lower twenties. Cause I knew that if like certain moves that I was making and how aggressive I was would just be weird in your thirties. So, you know, people, you know, it's like you're 40 and you're saying, yeah, I mean, like, please mentor me. Right? I mean, I would do these things where I'm literally pulling up to people's 
offices, you know, in the day. Just without, without you, notice. You, well, I didn't know any better on, if I'm being quite honest uh-huh. with you. But, um, you know, once you actually are in the room um, and then, you know, they're introducing you to their friend group and, uh, you know, and it, it, then it, your relationships and your network can just grow organically from mm-hmm. there. But um, I don't know if I answered your question. Did, did I answer your question? You, you did somewhat. Okay, did somewhat. Question, Let's say my question was, what was the value at? Oh, yeah. I'm what sure was the value at? Yeah. So I, I didn't necessarily um, have a value add to give. I think it's more so, especially at that age, people just want to help someone who they know is going to be successful. Mm. And now it's getting to the point where I can now exchange value. But right. initially, it was just more so I want to be, you know, have rock star success. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um May I please, you know, can I just be around you and just soak up information? And that's just where it started. For I, me. I feel like, and I'm, I'm curious to know out of those that you reached out to, who responded because they saw the email or who didn't just because they may have not seen it. But I feel like a lot of the high performing individuals that have success, they have a mentality of abundance where in their mindset, they're like, hey, I've, someone mentored me to get to where I am. No one did it by themselves and they want to pay it forward. And now you, Caleb, who's been mentored by XYZ people um, and have significantly impacted your life, you are in a position in the future when you're able to help that 17-year-old that reaches out to you, you're more susceptible to helping them because they you may see yourself in them when you're in your 40s and you're trying to help this young individual uh, reach that same level of success that you may have reached. That's actually 100% the conversation. That's actually 100% like the di- the dialogue. It's it's li- it's literally just pay it forward for the next guy. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, another thing is like how many times have we maybe heard a gem in a passing conversation or you just had that one conversation and it changed your perspective on a few things and then it, the result was you know, a mass amount of revenue or just a quantum leap in your mind. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it can be these little things, these little yeah. quirks. Yeah. Yeah. So you you said a couple of interesting things when you were talking. You you spoke about your first round of real estate. People are probably interested. You raise money from family and friends, right? Mm-hmm. And I have a, a number of questions for you as well. Sure. But what was that first conversation like for people who are just trying to get their feet wet, they're trying to get their first real estate deal? How did you approach family and you know where did you find the deal? Yep. Uh so when I first found my first deal, it was a a, a piece of land. Uh, right off uh, the main campus of Lehigh University, and originally when I was a freshman, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, that's where the idea sprung. Uh, I actually tried buying an off-campus house, single-family home. There are tenants already living in it, and my mindset was, as a freshman, if I can close on this property, uh, then sophomore, junior, senior year, I could just live in it. I could rent out the other bedrooms to friends. They'll help cover the mortgage and the expenses, and I could basically live there for free. That was my intention initially. Unfortunately, the property I sought after, uh, which was listed on Zillow, or actually, no, it was, it was a for sale sign, uh, so very tra- uh, traditional, old school way of marketing. Um, that did not, that, that ended up falling through, and then I ended up getting into financial planning, as I mentioned. And then I believe it was my junior year. It was either junior or senior year of college when I was studying for midterms. And I was honestly just sick of studying. And I decided, hey, you know what? I haven't checked in literally a year, but I'm just going to go on Zillow. And I ended up just going on Zillow. This property was uh, for sale for just a couple of days. And from there, I thought to myself, well, um, it, it's a great location. I honestly have no ex- – I literally at that point in time have no experience in real estate outside of uh, what I've somewhat learned through the first de- uh, first iteration in- as a freshman. And the first thing I did was I don't know how this deal is going to work out. I don't know what's going to come out of it. But I'm interested enough to – curious enough to learn a little bit more about it. And I ended up reaching out to the, the real estate agent. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, oh, I was kind of basically learning as I went. Which, of course, for people that don't have experience or that are hesitant to start off because they think that, hey, I need to go to school or I at least need to partner with a few people, that needs to be the first thing. Um, I I would say that uh, you can learn a tremendous amount through experience. Uh, And actually, one thing I forgot to note, when I first uh, had some success in financial planning, I actually ended up partnering with uh, one of my friends as a limited partner. Uh, so I wanted to get experience on and learn how do they operate as a real estate in, investment manager, and for me to learn one how do they operate, what is, what's the experience like to be an investor. So I ended up um, investing in that deal, and then over a year and a half time period, I ended up recouping my my capital back plus some returns, and then I used that to buy the first um, 
the, the first real estate deal. Uh, and even having gone through that experience as a limited partner, there's still a ton of uh, things that are involved, tasks that you don't experience as a limited partner, which is one of the benefits because you don't have to worry about it. Again, I was a student at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amount I've learned through going uh, through the transaction uh, of negotiating with the real estate agent, understanding, okay, it's a land deal. So what does a development project looks like? Uh, can we rent out parking spaces in the interim to cover some of the costs of property taxes, let's say? And uh, that that's really the biggest thing. So for those that are scared to pull the first, or I guess take the first step of doing their first deal, my recommendation is to partner with somebody. Uh, see who in your inner circle or somebody that you respect um, in, in your um, in your world uh, that is operating a real estate fund or they're, they're doing some sort of real estate transaction, is there a way for you to work with them on a limited partner basis? And for those who don't know, when you are a limited partner, you are essentially a silent investor. You don't have to worry about receiving phone calls in the middle of the night. You don't have to worry about putting your name, typically, don't have to worry about putting your name on the loan document so you're not financial, financially liable on the, the debt. Uh, and you have an easy way to still make money on your capital, hopefully, assuming you, you've selected a good partner, um, but an easy way for you to piggyback off of their experience and to learn from it. And even though I was a limited partner, again, that was a way for me to visit the property. And this is one thing that uh, we have um, one of our investors, uh, they're, they're also a real estate investor in their own right as a general partner and, and they're doing their thing, but they also want to experience from a limited partner perspective of what it looks like and, and learn from us. So that's a great way to get your feet wet. And then from there, hopefully build enough confidence to pull the trigger. And at the end of the day, it, it, I believe it's really more of a mental thing um, on pulling that first trigger and uh, analysis par paralysis, if that's the expression of thinking, maybe I'm not experienced enough or what if this and that. And I'd say if you're running your numbers, you have a criteria, uh, you've done some homework, uh, it's fairly challenging, especially if you've done your homework, challenging to lose money in real estate, right. unless you're being very risky or uh, you are um, trying to reach exponential returns, which again, my perspective is that's not the real estate game for long-term holding. I like real estate because it's tangible, it hopefully you have consistent cash flow coming in with your tenants and and i tell investors this i'm not trying to get the sexiest returns of 30 plus percent i'm i'm trying to target 12 to 15 percent annually that's the sweet spot and in an overall holistic and this is my financial planning background about to speak. When you look at your overall holistic financial plan, you may be invested in your 401k, you're invested in some stocks, you have your um, retirement accounts with your Roth IRA as an example. And if if you were to say, and most people are, I'm 100%, I'm invested, I'm 100% I'm, I'm invested in stocks, you, you are tied to that one asset class um, where you have an opportunity to expand that holistic financial approach and include, for example, real estate or now which has become more popular, um, cryptocurrencies or other investment strategies. Maybe you want to invest in a small business um, like a, uh, a laundromat or whatever it is. I like to look at a financial, um, an individual's financial plan on the holistic approach where you're not invested in one thing um, and it's a little bit more of a diverse, diversified approach. Uh, and that's one thing I love about real estate and I'd say to just pull the trigger, um, really to just get started. And if, even if that means starting off as a limited partner, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, if you're making a lot of money outside of real estate, it almost makes sense to be a limited partner exclusively. Mm -hmm. Number one, you own the real estate without having, without co-signing on the debt. Number two, you're paid before the general partner. So then you're, you, you also have the tax benefits that, that go directly to you. And the thing is, is that a general partner can spend X amount of months putting a deal together. But as a limited partner, you can take ownership positions in these entities at allocation. So your return and, and, the, and the type of compounding that you can do from the limited side is, is, is very, very attractive, quite frankly. What are we doing now? It's like, no, I'm kidding. But um, yeah. <laughs> we should have just been limited partners all yeah. this right, entire right. time. And it's it's also interesting too. Like you, sh I mean, you've been in this business for quite some time. So have you. Right. So have I. 
you build up this set of skills and you have this expertise. And a lot of times it's just better to lend on someone else's expertise, right? And just allow them to be the expert in their field. You do what mm -hmm. you do best and, and let them do what they do best. Because sometimes it's it's almost like the the act of catching, and this is not to discourage anyone, but sometimes the act of catching up to something, it's, it would be impossible for me to be as smart as you at what you do mm -hmm. and for you to be as smart as me mm -hmm. at what I do because just the years and time behind it. Like Kobe talked about this with practice. He would talk about he would practice like twice a day practice in the summer, practice in the winter, off season, he would always be practicing. So by the time like four or five years, he was in the league, six years, he was just so far ahead of everyone else. You just can't catch up to him, right? Yeah. So that's why I definitely, if you are in another business, you know, <laughs> probably lending to someone else who's managing these deals and, and doing them well and efficiently. Is the and and another thing I'd like to add to that is, let, let's say that you, you are interested in starting your own firm, let's say investment firm, and you don't have the experience, right? You can partner with somebody even if it's an advisor or somebody that has experience mm -hmm. and essentially what they're doing is they're lending their name to you. Oh, right. um, and uh, you can fairly quickly um, build a team, even if it's just advisors that have 20, 30, 40 plus years of experience around you and you have no experience, you are better set up to raise capital than someone that doesn't have that advisory board as an example because they're their association to you will be connected to your future investors that you're pitching mm -hmm. uh, just by, uh, by, by association. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are doing a lot in real estate, right? You're, you're staying busy. What are some of the things you guys are doing in your personal life to kind of stay energized or stay focused? What are some philosophies you want to share? Anything you can just shoot the breeze. Uh, I actually mentioned this on the previous podcast. One thing that to be very honest, over the past two years um, through the pandemic and, and having worked, I also was working full time at a real estate, full service real estate firm in DC mm -hmm. uh, and recently uh, left to further expand my, my own portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was actually neglecting myself personally and yeah. I was 100% focused on business and, and uh, investments in real estate growth where I did not take the proper time um, towards self care. Uh, and that's something where over the past couple of months, I really shifted my focus on that. And that's actually one of my goals in 2022 and entering into 2022 is looking back um, in at the end of 2022, looking back, if I can say that I didn't buy any more real estate, not that that's going to happen, but let's just say mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't buy any more real estate, but I prioritize myself, my, my mindset, uh, spiritual and um, physical health over everything else, it'd be a successful year and relationships uh, would be a successful year. So as of recently, one thing that I've begun uh, doing, which has already had a significant impact on me is um, I block off my mornings where I won't take any meetings. So from as soon as I wake up to about, let's say 10 or 10 30 AM, uh, I will not take any phone calls. Uh, if there's an emergency, maybe I'll make an exception, but for the most part, 95% of anything that's coming my way, mm -hmm. I'll defer it till after 1030. Mm -hmm. And what that allows me to do is to take, uh, to be able to control my day and to, which starts with the morning. And I'll start off by walking my dog. Um, I'll have, uh, go to the gym, um, journal a little bit or, or read, read something on, on, um, stocks or whatever I feel like reading. And, uh, and then take a nice shower, eat a good breakfast, and then I'll start my work day at 10 30 or 11. And my mindset prior was, well, shoot, I need to get to work immediately. But really what that ends up happening is it ends up, it's not, um, it's not sustainable. And at the end of the day in business, it's a marathon. It's that you, you could try to work super hard, say, Hey, let's, let's work till three in the morning. If there's a deadline. I understand that. But to do that just over and over and over. It's not sustainable. Some people it works great for you, but for me personally, it has not worked. Um, and personally, I, I, I value sleep um, and being able to get quality sleep. And, and now I'm valuing my mornings uh, in order for me to have a strong, uh, to have a great focus for the rest of the day. And I've learned and seen that my productivity has significantly increased and my overall being has increased as well, which again, on the, on the marathon route, um, has been very uh, successful for me. So that's, that's one thing that I'd say is blocking off my mornings and prioritizing that uh, over anything else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so important, like to the, to the marathon point, if we look at like someone like Donald Trump, I mean, maybe not the best example for people, but I mean, he became president in his mid seventies, right? So think about like the duration You're you're 26, I'm 26. How old are you? Just turned 27. Just turned 27. You're, you're talking about 50 years that we probably still have that we can still be hitting these major milestones and these marks. 
And we really have to be able to be prepared for that and last, right? Mm -hmm. We can be trying to burn ourselves out, do 80 hour weeks, but likely not getting as much as we think we're getting done. And then how long can you actually sustain that? You know, that's beautiful that you did that. Was there something that like had occurred where you realized like, I can't do this anymore? I think I was just being sick of myself, mm. uh, you know, just looking at myself in the mirror and it's like, you know what? I, one of my biggest regrets, future regrets would be, uh, when it's all said and done, I look at myself in the mirror. Did I do everything I could to reach my full potential? Mm. Um, and if I look at myself in the mirror in like 10 plus years or 20, whenever it is, I'm just like, like what the heck? Like that's, I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself in that regard. At least that's how I think now. Obviously, my opinion can change. So I thought to myself, you know what? Just do the work and, and prioritize and, 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 and do what you know is necessary to reach that full potential. Something else I did is because um, I, I go through periods and I'm still working on it. I go through cycles where I almost like, yeah, they're cycles. Um, and I feel abundantly stressed or overwhelmed mm -hmm. throughout these cycles as the business has grown. And this occurred specifically, I'd say, uh, towards the end of 2020, uh, when I was working full time at this real estate firm in DC, while I was working there full time, um, obviously the pandemic was going on, but as well as doing that, uh, I was also expanding my real estate portfolio in Pennsylvania and I was managing, self-managing essentially all by myself. Uh, and I, I got to around 80 beds, 80 student rentals. And at that point in time, I thought to myself, um, this isn't sustainable and I, I can feel it. Like I'm just feel it's actually, I, I fairly handle stress and anxiety very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's one of my strong suits, but, uh, there are still at times where I can reach my peak, uh, or my limit. And that's when I decided to prioritize delegation and I ended up hiring people to help support the growth and no, realizing, and I think some people feel this way. This is how I felt. Well, I can do it better. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean just because you could do it a little bit better than somebody else, it's still better to delegate it where you have at least your peace of mind. And then you could also focus on high value um, iterations of whatever you're doing. So for me, uh, in high, a high value activity would be finding new deals, uh, engaging with real estate investors, as an example, or building relationships around capital. Uh, for now, that's that's what I would define as high value. For me to answer a phone call from a, a tenant or coordinating the leases and things like that, that's not necessarily a high value task. So it's better for me to pay somebody to do that, right? That's money out of my pocket, but over the longevity of it, that allows me to focus on higher growth uh, tasks that will expand the, the, the revenues of the business model that will allow us to continue to pay them. Because at the end of the day, what's the point of building a business if you have to work for it full time? Right. If, it's nice to have a business, set it up where you work because you want to. But I think the idea is uh, to build something that can be autonomous, where when you decide you do want to retire or take a break or you want to do something else, you can step away and it can still operate and flourish without you. In the earlier stages, when you're planting the seed and watering it, you I believe you as an individual, you as the founder, you have to be in the weeds of, or I guess that's not a good analogy with having the seed flourish, but um, the, the proper care and attention to bring the seed to become a root, to then uh, blossom into a flower or whatever analogy you want to use, a tree, uh, and then eventually being able to step away and, uh, and then being able to focus on whatever else you want to do, but not being trapped. I feel like that's one of the value propositions, or at least what's marketed to a lot of people to get into entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and to, to step away from your nine to five job is to not feel trapped. But at the end of the day, if you're being, if you're transitioning from a nine to five to work in a business and you're miserable, even though you're technically free from an employer, it's still not as the, the grease, the grass is not always greener on the other side. A hundred percent. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you look at these seven figure companies and then you break it down and the actual net to the owner is like a hundred grand, right? So they're giving up a 40 hour work week for someone else to work 80 hours for themselves to probably maybe marginally make like less money than they would have with their particular skill set. I think something that people don't talk about enough is like net, right? not even just net on your business, but also net on your time, like 100%. managing that completely. But I think what's tough is like, we're, we're entrepreneurs, right? We have that type A driver personality, like always feeling like you wish you could clone yourself and never wanting to relinquish that control. But if you look at some of the best businesses in the world, that's what they do. They relinquish the control. They have all these systems in place that allow things to just move smoothly and and they're they're productive and they're profitable yeah and, and you have a complete uh weight off your shoulders when you do that and yeah. it's it's honestly 
uh, rewarding to be able to say, you know what, Sally's the one that's supposed to e execute that. And then if they don't do it properly, then there's an, a, a point of accountability mm -hmm. where maybe you're a little bit nicer to yourself on accountability. Oh, I didn't get to that task, but I'll do it tomorrow. Whereas if you're hiring someone to do that task and it's their job and they don't do it, there's more of a sense of accountability for that other person and they'll most likely get it done um, faster and more efficiently than you are, even though you possibly could do it better. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, a really, really good point too. Because sometimes also we have like different tasks and they kind of require like a different level of cognition, a different level of focus. And to be trying to switch throughout those tasks, like, okay, I need to do this amount of lead generation. Then I need to be in like a different state to send these emails or follow up with these people. It can be daunting. It can be mm -hmm. very, very tiresome. Yeah. But it's good that you saw that and were able to pivot and you look like you're you're feeling good. You're feeling oh, I appreciate good. that. You guys yeah. are, you guys are I had, closing I had a good deals, workout so. this morning. Okay, yeah. so you're I know Caleb good. did too when oh, we were right. talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's got, I always see this guy in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what about you, man? I know, I know, I don't know if we didn't bring this up yet, but you also trade. So yeah, that's yeah. a lot of psychology. Sure. So Yeah, I mean what I what's really what I struggle with is I constantly capitulate between playing the laborer game and the executive game. Mm. And so, like, for example, when I was living in Jamaica, I was training with Shelly Ann Fraser, right? So I have this, like, Olympic mentality of, like, be up before the sun, grind yourself to death. And um, I've really, you know, have faced some, like, really terrible burnout periods. Um, what I realize is, especially, like, you know, when, you, when you're coming from, you know, from starting from scratch, working all these different jobs, just trying to survive, that's that's one thing. But then when you start to get out of that place and you actually do have something to lose, when you're trying to actually scale, it takes a completely different um, skill set. Mm -hmm. And so what, one of the things that I have to constantly remind myself is that like capital is more efficient than labor. And so by being in a great state, being able to make smart decisions and whatever the case may be. The best trades, the best trades that I've ever made in my entire life has been looking at the market and just saying, I'm not getting involved in that. I am not going to be jumping out of this trade, being able to be patient, positioning myself to do so. So what I've really had to do is take a lot of time to really understand like who am I mm -hmm. and what makes me uh, actually tick as a person. So I've done like a lot of different um like personality tests and you know I, I agree with a lot of the things that they've said and so like understanding for example that i'm an extrovert i know that i need to be around people um because that is what fills up my cup long time long periods of time in solitude is like not healthy for me mentally whatsoever mm -hmm. um i'm also really great at strategy but when it comes to but i also have weaknesses as well and so being able to now understand that i can um, be focused on constantly building my strengths and then ensure that I'm partnered with, you know, other people who may have skill sets or perspective that I quite frankly lack. Um, on the delegation piece, I mean, that was, that was, I mean, I think this is probably one of the greatest, um, examples of understanding the, the power of leverage and delegation because, you know, let's just, let's just go on the wholesaling perspective. So when I was just like in a room making a call, um, you know, making calls. Well, if I'm not, there's a direct correlation to how many calls you're making, how much you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. So if you're not um, calling and dialing and you're taking that one hour break, well, guess what? That's less deals that you're touching. Less deals that you're touching is, is meaning that, you know, that's going to be less deals in your pipeline. So I think when I was like quantitatively, I think I was, you know, probably making somewhere between 100 and 150 calls a day, mm -hmm. every single day, trying to force myself to make a deal. But when I really took a step back, organize my systems, retain my earnings, started to identify where are the high value points in the system. Well, you know, connecting with, I mean, dialing is one aspect of things, connecting with people, one thing, but really it's spending the most amount of time speaking with, uh, highly quantified leads. And so I'm not, the more time that I'm spending skip tracing, for example, and spending six hours doing that, for example, is the less time that I'm actually spending on the call. So when I actually took the step back and started to be more strategic with my time, we ended up building a system where we're now touching 30,000 leads per month. Mm -hmm. That's more leads than um, I could have ever like physically worked. That would be like an entire month of, or almost an entire year of calling and deals being done in a month because you actually decided to create a strategic system over everything else um so creating systems identifying the high the high quality or high touch point um activities 
Um, what Dallas talked about, which is like the physical aspect of things and, and working out. I mean, when I'm not consistent in exercising and working out and, and my energy and my mental focus is um, directly inhibited. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, being around great people, I really prioritize not just work and grinding, but also building like solid quality relationships. Because the thing is, is that I've been in periods where my romantic relationships, everything else like that was just all to the wayside, 100% about work. And when you do that, and then work just, you know, you get your ass handed to you in the markets mm. or whatever the case may be. I mean, there's so many different angles mm -hmm. to it. There's number one, one angle of it where it's like you, you reach the success, but then you've just been grinding. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really build those relationships. That's pain on one end. And then if you get your ass handed to you, on the other hand, um, then it's like, man, you don't even have that other supportive infrastructure around you. Mm -hmm. And, um, what I realized is, is that if you really want to go after exponential results or the marathon that everyone's talking about at the table now, you really have to build your foundation, not just in your relationships, but also mentally in, in terms of your skill sets. So that's really how I just spend my time, man. I, I call my mom every single day. Um, I speak with her every single day. I, I, mm -hmm. I make sure that my, my sister and I, we go to brunch every other week. Um, and she calls me all the time. Um, I speak to my brother all the time. I make sure I speak to my aunt and my family. I'm starting to position myself where um, I can be in Jamaica maybe like once a month or once a quarter moving forward mm -hmm. um, just because that's what really gives me energy. And uh, just being around great people, man, that's the biggest thing for me. And I'm still trying to master the schedule. It's really hard um, when you're trading like European markets that are that start you know, at 2 a.m. and then you have a real estate um, activities, which are your nine to five. So I'm still figuring that out, but one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I think it's, it's the family aspect and like the, the memories aspect, I think are something yeah. that's you, you really can't neglect, right? Cause think about your, your, your favorite memories. Yeah. You've, you had some, probably some crazy checks, but it was probably just sitting at the beach with your family or you were with your girlfriend. You were just having that, that time. Right. And mm -hmm. you can't recreate that no matter how much money you get but then the money is like equally important right so it's like trying to find this perfect balance of of living like a truly full life right because yeah. it could it could change at any minute right we never know when we're gonna mm -hmm. go right so it's just trying to do do the most that we can did you have any of these dreams when you were like a kid like where, where does this journey start for you like i know you had mentioned that do you mind bringing up some of your background like your schooling some of your early yeah. education yeah so i had a unique uh background or i guess experience growing up uh, I was put, so I'm not French, okay. but my parents decided to put their children and myself included in a French school. So our French, or our, our entire education leading up to university was in the French system. Okay. Is so, this in France or is this in States? Uh, so I, I had classes uh, for, all my classes were in Maryland okay. uh, in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And then there were three years where I studied abroad mm -hmm. uh, at separate occasions. It was, I think it was like second grade, fifth grade, and then sophomore year of high school mm -hmm. uh, where I lived in Paris. Okay. And uh, growing up in the system, I of course wanted to embrace the American culture. I wanted to play American sports, which I, I ended up doing through clubs and things of that nature, like football and, and basketball. Uh, but I always wanted to to play for a, a American high school team. Mm -hmm. uh, and now in hindsight, looking back at it, I'm super grateful and appreciative. And, and I'm, I wouldn't replace it for anything in the world to having gone through that experience because I'm, I was able to embrace many different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, all my friends, their, their fr high school friends are all from different parts of the world. Um, having lived in France, I'm now have really close friends in, in Europe. And that experience, I think probably opened my eyes to, um, which impacted my personality of being able to, uh, one, be putting in different environments and being comfortable with it. I was mm -hmm. one of the only Americans in the school system and oh, wow. my French compared to theirs wasn't as strong because it wasn't my first language. Whereas for them, they're all French speaking. They, they speak French at home uh, with their parents, um, et cetera. So I ended up being somewhat more comfortable with just being myself uh, because I could never get to the same level as them in that French speaking domain mm -hmm. and also being able to travel overseas, which some people, they don't even have a passport or they've never left their town. And that's one thing that, um, I know that I'm very uh, fortunate to having 
gone through that and, and, and having access to being able to, to, to live overseas for a period of time. And uh, I think that significantly impacted the way I am and, and always, I guess, being more exploratory, curious. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I definitely, I have a hard time, I guess there are pros and cons, but I have a hard time staying put. So right after, oh, yeah, yeah so like right, right after college, I ended up moving to Florida, mm -hmm. uh, to start a tech company that didn't end up panning out, but I, I gained a lot of experience and, um, and that was a phenomenal, uh, opportunity to, to network and, and build relationships down in Florida. I ended up going to Pennsylvania for a year, came back to DC for the past two years. And eventually I, I certainly want to, to move around a little bit more. And I think, um, ideally I'd like to have a setup where I'm able to travel at least one month out of the year, ideally three to be able to explore new cultures, new places. And I think when you're able to explore uh, more of like the adventure exploratory phase, you're able to see new things and in a world that's constantly innovating, uh, and, and not staying stagnant. I think that's a, a, a really valuable, um, asset to be able to have, mm -hmm. um, because you don't know what's going on across the world unless you're just solely focused on, uh, or if you're solely focused on where you are now, where you, in your current municipality and things of that nature, and you don't know who you may meet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another big thing that I really appreciated growing up um, and having that background. For sure, for sure. And we, we kind of had a similar upbringing too. So I moved to Jamaica when I was 12. I left when I finished uh, high school. And just being able to be in these different environments, I went to international school, so you mm -hmm. meet all these different people. You see how different people operate, how different cultures work. Mm -hmm. And you see all like the beautiful and kind of perfect things from all these different cultures and you can kind of meld them into your own life and, and see how you kind of want to operate from there. Another thing too, like staying put, like I feel like I cannot stay put. It's hard. Like I moved around so much in my youth. Like I'm just like, all right, where's the next place? Like, can I operate a business here? Okay, then then we'll figure it out, you know? And, I, I'm sure, and we talk about that all the time. It's like traveling the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just trying to run everything from everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, I know one thing for sure is that, uh, um, so I went to a new school every year from eighth grade to essentially college. This is insane. Um, but one of the benefits of like changing environments so frequently is um, the constant adaptability that you get. Mm -hmm. And then also you gain the skill set where it's like, damn, like every year I have to go and build relationships from scratch, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love moving around. I think living in Jamaica, for example, was definitely one of the greatest, like, um, consciousness, ex consciousness expanding experiences like of my life. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much more to the world that needs to be explored. And with sure. technology and everything that we can be doing virtually, there really isn't any reason why we can't, mm -hmm. um, you know, move around and see the world for what it is. Mm -hmm. I have a question about your adaptability because this is how I am personally. When you, let's say you're, you're going to travel somewhere with friends or, or whatever, and there's an agenda. Do you care to know what the agenda is, or do you just show up and you're just happy to go along with the ride? No, I'm I'm so good with just showing up. I I'm, mean, I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, it's just yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like like if there's an agenda, cool, like yeah. right. But is this like? I, I actually like to not know because yeah. I like it's more the, exciting. Yeah, it's more exciting. And, and mm. my my mindset is no matter what the situation is, I'm gonna make the best out of it. Mm. And to have that sense of the unknown and just going along the ride, um, that's always fun for me. So I, I was curious to know what. Mm -hmm your uh, thought was on that i think some of the i think the term is like hedonic adaption because you know sometimes you see like for us we saw so many different things in our youth like the same kind of monotony of just like day-to-day -day life it's you just can't kind of do it right so you kind of need these exciting things to push you forward and to, to look forward to the threshold is yeah, yeah 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 the excitement needs to be there yeah and i think um one thing and i don't know if i, I mean for some hopefully this uh, speaks to them uh sometimes you may think, okay, I can't take a vacation or I can only take a week off or two weeks um, for those that are entrepreneurs, they just want to work, work, work. But I think also taking a, a break and taking yourselves out of the weeds and having more of a eagle view, a uh, 10,000 foot view of, of uh, what you're doing and maybe distract yourself on a different activity. You may have an epiphany on something that you were trying to accomplish because sometimes uh, if you're trying to think of an idea and you keep on thinking of the idea, you sometimes get in a, I guess, um, creative block, mm -hmm. whereas maybe you're just working out or maybe you're going on a walk or you're doing something other than that activity, then it comes to you. Right. So that's another thing where uh, if this helps for those that are having that that tough time of trying to um, allow them for, or providing themselves permission to, to get away from the work environment of that 24-7 mentality, uh, it could have some 
benefits that you may not be able to quantify initially, but you don't know what idea or who you may meet um, during that uh, trip. Mm -hmm. and, and, and taking time to do, the more time that you spend doing thinking time is the less of a stupid tax that you pay. Yeah. Y you know, so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know like, especially like locally, like one thing that I do like almost religiously is go into the mountains and just walk in silence. Mm -hmm. And just that amount of time where I can just like flush out the noise, the stimulation, and just like really get deep into thinking through problems. Uh, it's, it's probably some of the most profitable time of my week is just mm -hmm. actually just walking through the mountains in solitude, just thinking and processing. For sure, for sure. Like pushing yourself into these mid-grade and high high state like flow states, mm -hmm. whether you're doing it by traveling or skydiving or you know, riding quads, jet ski, whatever oh, yeah, it is. Fun, yeah. Like the <laughs> ideas yeah. you get from, from those times is like the silence, but then like this semblance of activity so powerful it's also this positive inspiration as well because when you have that positive dopamine of like traveling and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff you want to go kill it into your work so you can go back and keep doing the things that you love doing 100 percent. yeah that freedom right you like notice the freedom and you're like all right i can do a couple more things here and i can do more of this mm -hmm. you know and that's just like the game of life right mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. yeah yeah do you guys want to take a slight pause everyone stretch and then like maybe you know, deep into like a maybe more casual conversation how do you guys want to do that Sure. Okay, right, just everyone get fresh, perfect, stretch a little perfect. bit. All right, so, so I'm good on time. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we, you can just, we can just be organic and whatever okay. needs to be done, we can do that. Okay, and just I, don't I, forget I to talk to me. I have to be back by like around 2.30. I have like 15 more minutes. Okay, you. perfect. We're all, right, all in the same time. Um, but yeah, a lot of that, you were talking about risk and like people assuming that risk is worse than it actually is. A lot of that is from like, you know, your reptilian brain, like your caveman brain. I forgot what book this was in, but like, you know, in prehistoric days, right? Like, no, not prehistoric, but just say when we were... When we were early humans, like, you know, two out of three calamities could mean your death, right? So you could, you know, something would eat you or you would eat a berry and you would die or you just fall and you would break your leg and then you would die. And like our brains have not evolved out of that, right? We're still in that mind frame where when we take risks, we always are like assuming it's going to be super fatal or assuming like this, you know, hyper negative thing such as death. And I think that's why so many people are afraid of risk and just can't analyze it appropriately because it's like ingrained in your brain not to take certain risks because in the worst case you will die that that that's certainly one aspect of things but i think also another thing when it comes to risk is it comes to uh, classical and cultural conditioning mm -hmm. right and you know i think that sometimes we're looking to you know institutions or especially educational institutions institutions in my opinion sometimes to solve problems that they weren't necessarily meant to solve good point um you know so when i'm looking at well it just kind of like sidetracked or whatever the case may be. But I think like someone would take like something like dropping out of college, for example, mm -hmm. they would probably just blanket that decision to be something as risky. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that they won't ask necessarily questions into why or what circumstances led to doing something that may be so as unconventional as dropping out. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like, for example, the when it, when it came to the decision to drop out, for example, um, at the time I had my mentor, at the time I had the, well, I, I kind of have like a like a brain uh, far here, but I'll circle back. Okay, <laughs> okay, no, no worries. Oh, yeah, I mean, one thing I would say is perceived risk, and I think just to touch on what you're saying, yeah. societal, like from a societal perspective, uh, we, conf I feel like what's comfortable um, allows us to conform, mm -hmm. and conformity I believe is basically you're the average of mm -hmm. those that you're conforming with, right? right? And um, if you have you seen Squid Game, actually, I have, yeah. Okay, so for those that saw Squid Game, uh, this is more relevant to you. But there's a scene. I'm not gonna. I'm not spoiling anything. There's a scene where uh, one of the last games they have to, or I think it was the fifth game, where they had to select where they want, they basically have to select a, a vest mm -hmm. with a number on it out of like 12. And initially, everyone decided to select in the middle because they felt more comfortable as a pack. Um, and for those that selected on the ends, uh, obviously you feel a little bit more out of place. So going back to the reptilian brain, uh, we wanna feel safe in numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and that holds true from a societal perspective, having a little bit more of a relevant ex, uh, example, when you go to school, uh, you're, you're taught in high school, middle school, high school, leading up to your college career is you want to go to school, higher education, 
uh, to be educated, to then get your diploma that will allow you to get a job where you have security to work uh, from your nine to five or whatever the hours are leading up to your fit getting a family, and then you could retire in your 60s and enjoy your life at that point in time. Um, and for those that say, you know what, I'm not going to go to college, or uh, I, I may have gone through college, but I don't want to work for an employer, I want to start my own business, which you're deviating from what you're taught, uh, which again is straying away from conformity and uh, going, on the, uh, the, the, going on the periphery of what most people are doing. And I think that's one of the things that makes it a little bit scary. It's just like naturally we want to feel safe, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, what what is safe? You know, uh, what, 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 ah, there we go. Yeah. So like, yeah. What, what 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 is safety? You want to jump into the, the, yeah. piggy, piggyback it, off that? That was that was actually kind of um, exactly what I wanted to speak about, which is the concept of anti fragility, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is, is that there's always we always have risk. Right, but the thing is, is that that risk is replaced in certain areas. So if you look at the so the steady rising career trajectory that people are coming, it's safe, it's steady. When you have like a COVID event and that drop, you that you weren't necessarily building those muscles to deal with the level of complexity and the you know risk and you know losing your job and all those different types of things because it's a soft, steady, every single day career. I, I know one of the things that like uh, Nicholas. Nassim Taleb or whatever the, his name is, was kind of talking about was how a taxi cab driver in London, for example, their day to day like revenue may be volatile, but their year over year stability is actually more stable than most careers. Mm. And that's actually something. So we're always like replacing and placing um, and, and packaging risk all around. I know, especially when it came to, you know, the, the decision to leave school and be an entrepreneur. I traded that short-term safety net, as they say, for the longer-term um, stability of owning assets, owning your own business, learning from the mistakes and losing stuff. Um, so yeah, and another thing as well is that a lot of people, you know, what I what I kind of really realized is, especially when I had my first breakout in trading, was it's not necessarily that these traders that are getting these exponential outcomes um, are the, are the you know these crazy smart guys it's just more so that they position themselves in activities in which they can see 10x exponential returns and I, I think sometimes you know we're not positioning ourselves enough in these and we want that result but we're not positioning ourselves in a way where we can we can get those exponential results and you know those types of opportunities are a lot more available to people than maybe they may quite frankly understand. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever listened to or read The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale? No, I'm not. So that was pretty much, it. that's basically what it's about. It's about conformity, right? What's the difference between, you know, a bunch of people graduate out of high school, they're all 18. What's the difference between one who's, you know, kind of poor by the time he's 65 or one who's extremely wealthy? Mm by the time you're 65. Um, and the number one reason for people not succeeding is conformity. A lot of times they're doing things just because other people are doing it and they're not really thinking about it. And I think a lot of times we we all get trapped in that, right? Because I think that's part of human nature. You will survive mm -hmm. if you conform and you follow, mm -hmm. right? We, we are in tribes. That's just how we're ingrained. But being able to step back from that and really say, what do I want? What am I doing? Where am I going? I think is, is probably one of the most important things that anyone could do really at any age. Mm -hmm. um, I talk to my dad all the time, super smart guy, and he just turned, I think like 53 or maybe 54. And we were talking, I'm like, he still has like 30 years that he could really do anything. You can live on, you can live an entire life in a decade. You can mm -hmm. do a million things. So it's like at any, at any given time in our life, we can totally, we can look at the situation and we can pivot and we can make new decisions. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if, if we all redid every single day of our existence mm -hmm. from right now, we'd be like 50 mm. at the end of that process. Yeah. In terms of understanding just like everything everything that we know about time right now, if we doubled that, we would just be at our half-life, right. um, assuming that we have healthy habits. <laughs> so um, I think when you really just think about that, and, and that's another thing as well, is that if you're really passionate about or very clear about what you're what you want to do, and then you're spending your entire, the, the equivalency of your entire childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood pursuing that one, you know, goal that you have, it's pretty hard not to get there. And 
we, I think we are really underestimate because, you know, think about all the different things that we've done, you know, throughout our lives, childhood. I mean, how many years did we actually spend focused so far? Right. You know, maybe it's been seven years at the most, maybe whatever but the case like, might actually be. Actually like educated and focused. Yeah, probably. but educated and focused and whatever. I mean, the, the results just become more exponential with time. Right. Um, and that's where things just get exponential and, go, mm -hmm. you know, go even further. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So I know you guys are, are a little bit, that was a gem, by the way. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to diminish that at all. No, no, I know no. you guys are a little bit pressed on time. So let me just intro you guys so we can sure. have an intro for the being on the podcast. My name is Gavin. You are listening to Sometimeish. This is a podcast where sometimes we talk about life, sometimes we talk about business, sometimes we may talk about current events or just speak what's on our mind, but all the time you will be educated, informed, and you will want to tune in for another episode. I'm here with the real estate entrepreneur, trader, Caleb Jackson, and I'm here with real estate entrepreneur, Dallas Basha. Thank you guys so much for joining me on the show. Thank you, my good sir. Yeah. Appreciate you. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Absolutely. This yeah. is a great time to talk to you guys. You guys shared a wealth of knowledge, and I would love to have you guys back on the show for for another episode thank a, you a million views in six months uh, let's, let's get it guys let's yeah, get it give you guys a cut. <laughs> <laughs> and bro you, you have like a radio dj voice yeah, i, I know, love it it's so smooth yeah gavin uh, is a dangerous dude but no 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 this man is a dangerous we'll, we'll keep, that, we'll keep that offline though yes 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 <laughs> But yeah, if you guys could go ahead, like, subscribe, uh, give us five stars, give us reviews, and add this to whatever playlist that you have, whatever system you're, you're listening on. And we look forward to seeing you for another episode. Take care. Thank you. Good, good. Thank oh, you man. guys Blessings so much. Beautiful. Yeah. Love yes, you guys did a great job. Appreciate you. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you guys so much.